Hey, this episode of the Chef and Father podcast, we got the one and only gluten-free girl and the chef. Gluten-free girl is Shauna Ahern and her husband Dan is a chef. They have a beautiful daughter and they blog over at glutenfreegirl.com. Shauna is an amazing writer, so it's really just beautiful to see how she puts together words and talk about food and life and love. And this interview, we get into all that. We talk about what it's like to live a gluten-free lifestyle, what it's like to have daughters and how we incorporate our life around food and just talk about you know mainly the the pleasure of food and how important that is to create an atmosphere of love and pleasure around food in order to get our kids to eat better so without further ado let's just check out the interview really great stuff in here it's a chef and father podcast gluten-free girl and the chef I'm super excited today to have you guys on the Chef and Father podcast. We're excited to be this here. It's going to be fun. It's my show. We just kind of free form it. Just want to talk. Um, so the, basically the first thing I want to know is from you guys, like, tell me about when you first found out you had a food allergy mm. or how did that go about? Like, were you kind of miserable your whole life and, mm. and it took so... Yeah. Well, I would say, looking back, I think I was low-level lousy all my life, and I had lots of flus and colds and pneumonia five or six times before I was in my 20s. Um, so I didn't feel good, but I also didn't know any difference. So I just thought, well, this is what it feels like to be a human person. <laughs> and then when I was in my 20s and then especially my 30s, it just kept getting worse and worse. I had surgery, and I never quite recovered from it, and I you know, would get every flu that caught, went through town. Um, and then in 2005, I was so sick that we just wasn't clear what the heck was going on, but friends thought I was dying. You know, I was going to the emergency room all the time and I was getting tested for different cancers. I was like sleeping 18 hours a day. It was just bad. Stomach pain, everything. Migraines, brain fog, and all kinds of lovely unmentionable in things to do with my intestines. <laughs> so, um... When I finally got diagnosed with celiac, it's because I advocated for myself and I pushed for a celiac test for a doctor, uh, with, for a doctor to do, and then I went off gluten and it was like a revolution. It was three days and I woke up and thought, whoa, this is what it feels like to be human. I was wrong. Um, and within six months, felt better than I had ever felt in my life. And so I, I was lucky. It was I was so sick. There was no question in my mind of like, should I cheat? Should I not? Do I can I give up gluten? I'm like, oh heck, if it's no chemotherapy, no surgery, and just food, I'm good. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah, and was this just wheat gluten? All gluten. Awesome. So wheat, rye, barley, triticale, spelts, count, farro, like all of the ancient forms of wheat. Any of those have what's called gluten, and. Each of them has a different form of it, gliadin, glutenin, you know, it, we don't want to get too technical, but they, it's the elastic protein in those grains that mess up my system. My body reads them as a poison. And through all your, before that, no, no doctor or anyone ever, No. did, did they even mention any like dietary change no. at all as a way to... No, fix? nobody ever did. And it's still pretty rare. I mean, I hear from fans all the time who say, yeah, I went to the doctor and... They did their standard battery tests and they couldn't figure it out. And then they started suggesting maybe it's psychological. You know, I mean, you don't seem to have anything. <laughs> Never ask them what they're eating. Um, doctors really aren't, medical doctors aren't trained in food at all. They take it like a 10-minute nutrition class, it seems, in medical school. So it's not what most people are thinking first. Yeah, and a nutrition class that's probably sponsored by the government. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Watching videos from the seventies, yeah, right? you know, yeah, yeah. It's it's. Uh, I find that a lot of doctors are uncomfortable talking about food. There's such a stigma to do with health, weight, mortality, all that stuff. That you know, it's pretty socially sanctioned now to tell patients don't smoke cigarettes. You know, that's pretty dumb. But you're not you're going to get a lot of doctors who say, "Now, what are you eating? And how are you eating it? And where are you sourcing it?" That's just not going to happen. Yeah, I heard a guy the other day. He was saying he. He brought his dog into the vet and was saying, something's wrong with my dog, I don't know. And the first thing the vet said was, well, what are you feeding him? Mm. Oh, 
we're kind of like, yeah, shouldn't that the, be the first thing your doctor says? Like, let's that would get be a your, good question, wouldn't it? <laughs> let's get your uh, your food history going and see if we can fix that. I think we're so far removed from where our food comes from for the most part. A lot of us, we don't really know. You know, it comes out of a box. It comes out of, you know, the, the store. It comes from a styrofoam package that, you know, the idea of, well, what would I be eating that would hurt me doesn't really occur to most people at first. And, um, and I think that's what's interesting about the last 10 years is people are starting to ask those questions and really think about their food in a very different way. Yeah, and I also think it's cool where, um, you know, now that we have these new media technologies, we don't have to rely on the, the mainstream media right. to tell us right. about nutrition or doctors. Right. We can do our own research mm -hmm. and search it out. And there's probably ways that that can be bad, meaning... Oh, yeah. There's an oversaturation. Sure. Mm -hmm. Anyone like us can can say anything we want. Right. And people can believe it or not. But it's like right. there's definitely things you you shouldn't be believing. Or I think you shouldn't believe anything. Right. I just think you should listen to everything mm -hmm. and then talk, you know, talk to people and then do your own experiments. Mm -hmm. Well, I think story is the most powerful force we have besides love. <laughs> you know, like... Um, how many people have been moved by hearing someone else's story and thinking, oh, that sounds like me. Maybe I'm not alone. And when you are suffering from any kind of illness, but particularly one that is related to food and the culture that doesn't seem to care about great food all the time, hearing somebody else's story makes you feel not alone. And so that's really the impetus for me to have begun, begun writing the, the site. And what we still do today is just like, hey, let's just share a story. I'm not interested in one bit in telling anybody how to eat. That's not <laughs> I know, how would I know what their body needs. Um, but I am interested in sharing my story and hearing other people's stories. And if some of it feels familiar and it leads me down a path that will make me feel better, then great. Cool. So tell me a bit how, since you're a gluten-free girl and the chef, mm -hmm. how are you able to take a degenerate chef like Dan and, and, turn, and turn him into this awesome dad. He a lot of now. polishing. He's way better I've heard, than I am. I've heard he's, stories. No, no, he's, he's fine. <laughs> it's funny, people, because I'm the one who talks, generally. Yeah, that's true. You're, I'm the voice of it all, and I, I'm the writer, so it's, it's all in my voice, and sometimes intensely personal, so people will think that I'm kind of the driving force, but all like, he's way better than I am. He's so, I mean, we would all fall apart without Danny around. And that was true from the minute we met. Yes, yeah, so um, it's not done yet. <laughs> my daughter here has climbed on my lap since we've started recording. I think we got, I think we got four minutes in We're before she's here. here. But um, yeah, I think we should just get right into kids then. Mm, yeah, I don't, know if we, I don't know if we need to hear your your love story. On this one. <laughs> not again. <laughs> Go to the website. You can read it. Mm -hmm. Her bio well, well, so so, so Dan, are you do you have any sort of food allergies or? Uh, lactose or... intolerant. Yeah, which you didn't realize till you met me. No, but then now I think about it, I never could finish a bowl of cereal with milk. It had to be sugar sweetened, sugar sweetened. But I, I can never finish a glass of milk. There's no way. Yeah. So I mean, if I eat, like last night, I had a little sour cream on my baked potato, and Sean just looked at me like, "Yep, oh, I'm gonna feel that one later." <laughs> But it's not as bad as my gluten thing, so no, it's something all. you choose. No. But no, I mean, I think, you know, you didn't La know that. Lactose-free boy and the girl. It doesn't really <laughs> that doesn't have that to it. <laughs> Lactose-free chef. Well, I, wouldn't ad I wouldn't advocate putting any kind of hyphenated, you know, thing before your name because I'll be a girl forever, but that's okay. <laughs> You're my girl forever. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. So, um, so you have a daughter and she's four? Five. Five. Five, five going on 18. Mm -hmm. And have you, do you, so obviously you, you live a gluten-free lifestyle mm -hmm. in your home. Have you always chose to have your, have your daughter be gluten-free? No, I mean for the first four years of her life, four and a half, five almost, we let her eat gluten outside of the house. She seems to be fine with it. We waited until she was after one. I mean, because we just were giving her really basic foods. You know, she was getting sweet potatoes and avocados and eggs and things like everyone else. It's it's pretty intense. My celiac is such if I get even an eighth of a teaspoon, I get pretty dramatically ill for five days. Um, so having gluten in the house is is risky. Um, you know, there's certainly precautions we can take, but it's, since she's already eating really, really well, and, you know, doesn't need the gluten. Um, so we just decided to have the house be gluten-free and let her eat whatever she wanted outside of the house. 
And for a while, she seemed to be fine with that. And then this year, it was became clear that she wasn't fine with gluten, and we had her tested, and we took her on gluten, and she does much, much better without it. Yeah. So, but it's it's like been no transition whatsoever. You know, she knows what gluten is already. We've talked to her how to. She asks everyone. It's, I think it's great for kids. The kids I know with food allergies are amazing advocates for themselves. So she'll go to a party and say, "Does that have gluten in it?" Oh, I can't eat that. Yeah, a, a friend of ours. He's what three or four now. Four now, yeah. And he'll say, he's known forever that he he can't eat da- dairy or eggs or gluten. And he'll say, or corn. Or corn. Does this have corn in it? I can't have corn. Is, is there cornstarch? Yeah. There's no cornstarch. Okay. I, is it eggs or gluten? And just like it's, I mean, that that young, it's amazing that they can. He knows what. And that, gonna, like, send them to the and that skill is going to translate into the rest of their lives. You know, these are kids who are not afraid to ask and stand up for themselves. You know, so I think it's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. But yeah, no. We now now she and I both eat gluten free, and then Danny eats gluten at a restaurant. And, but, but she can't have dairy like me. <laughs> yeah, she got black. You got lactose from you and gluten from me. So we'll see. We'll see how that proceeds. We, we, we thought it was great because she would give her an ice cream cone, and she'd have three or four bites, and like, okay, I'm done. And John was, I was like, "Wow!" By her willpower, I'm but you found out she make you give her a tummy ache. Yeah, she's finally yeah. old enough to say, "Every time I eat cow milk, I get a stomach ache." Oh, okay. Well, then don't eat get ice cream anymore. So she doesn't. <laughs> she's fine. But yeah. um, but like switching her, we were very lucky because switching her to a gluten free, lactose free. I mean, she can eat cheese. You know, other dairy's fine, but. Uh, diet was just no big deal because most of what we feed her is just real food, you know, and she's, we were trying to challenge her and, you know, get a lot of gluten in her to see, to get this test. It was accurate. So we were, we bought her like organic graham crackers and we realized it was the first thing we'd ever bought, bought her in a box. You know, she was like, Mm -hmm. I could go to the grocery store and buy something, you know? (laughs) So now we just, we just eat what we eat. It's not a big deal. Yeah. It's kind of, it's almost sometimes a, Something like that could be a blessing when it's mm. it forces you to buy real food because right. you know you have a head of broccoli, right? You know, there's no gluten in there, right? Exactly. Or another something you know, that uh, granola or something, mm-hmm. it's so easy to be like, oh, we snuck in some wheat mm-hmm. berries mm-hmm. or something else, or the oats are contaminated with gluten, which happens once so you're getting gluten free oats, yeah. So you, you have to become a pretty strict label reader right but i you know there's all this talk about labels all the time and i always think i look down at my shopping cart and i'm like nothing has a label (laughs) i don't you know i talk about some in the the first one but it's like i don't i don't need to worry about if my food's labeled with gmos because i my thing says grass-fed steak exactly and that's all that's in there we look down at our cart and it's 85 percent from the produce section you know and that's that's just how we eat um, and, it, and it's funny that we live in a world where that's unusual and that people actually will sneer at us sometimes like, oh, you're such a, we get this yeah. very small voice, but people will say like, oh, you're so like classist because, you know, you're only eating food that comes from farms and I was like, yeah. well, how is that so weird? <laughs> it's, yeah. a, it's a telling you statement. You eat this <laughs> big caring about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> eating but, olive oil and you know, organic fruit, you know, not everyone yeah. can afford that food, which is true. Um, but it is something good to talk about of, of wh- why that is or how you handle that where because mm. I, I think the same thing where I, I really care about what I eat and I, I'm lucky I don't have any sort of allergies right. of extreme I know everybody has food allergies right. they don't know about mm. and if you really listen to your body you can start to pick like oh this makes me feel better and this mm-hmm. makes me feel worse mm-hmm. but when I go to a dinner party, I find it hard to keep those standards up because mm-hmm. I don't want to be rude. Right. And I used, I used to, uh, as a caterer of dinner parties, when people started coming in, allergies aside, because that's a whole different story. Right, but right. when they're coming in, like, I'm on the Atkins diet and I'm yeah, on this yeah. and I'm on the South Beach diet and yeah, yeah. and you, and I'm like... That seems weird to show up to someone's house and start dictating right. how you know, your agree. food's going to be. And I, I really, it's hard for me because saying I can't eat gluten, it will make me violently ill, gets lumped into that same group. And it's just not, I mean, I'm the least, Danny is I both, but we're just the least fussy people to feed because if you make food for us, we're excited. 
very few people want to feed. <laughs> people <laughs> don't want to have oh, a certain house between that. my having celiac and him being a chef. Nobody, they're all terrified to feed us. So, you know, I mean, like, you know, meatloaf without any breadcrumbs that are gluten and a baked potato. I'm excited. It's, it doesn't have to be fussy. And I'm certainly never going to go to somebody else's house and say, now is that beef grass fed? Because I just feel like if someone's made you food, that's already an act of love. There's no way I'm going to dictate how they should be cooking. Yeah, it's kind of, it's that fine line because you want to also, sometimes you want to, they have, they have no idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you start, I feel like, start talking about it, mm -hmm. then <coughs> people either get very offended. Yep. Because a lot of that comes from if you, if you feel stupid, right? you act offended because that's a front of. Sure, sure. Not to be like, oh, I'm. I don't, as opposed to being open and being like, oh, really? I'd like to, I'd love to know. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I, I heard a guy in the store once said, oh, organic, that's just another term for cost more. Mm -hmm. And then <laughs> one time my mom said, she goes, oh, is, is organic, does it really taste that much better to be mm -hmm. worth the price? And I'm mm -hmm. like, well, some, you know, sometimes, but there's a lot more to it. Mostly I don't want to fill my body full of just, pesticides. Just the way it tastes. Well, I just feel like... You know, what we try to do on our website is just an offering. It's just, hey, we're going to let you into our lives for a moment and let you see what we're eating. And because we love this meal, it was fantastic, you know, and it's it's the same way that humans just talk about food. People who are interested in food talk about it food all the time. So yeah. putting it on a website is just an extension of that conversation. I think, unfortunately, people somehow feel like we are there for saying you should be eating this food, too. Um, and it's a very different, different way of being. That's not how we are. And I think like you yeah. said, they get defensive because they feel like, oh, I wish maybe I should be feeding my kid that way. And then they, can't, yeah. they don't have the facility to do it. They don't have the money to do it. Or they just, nobody's taught them that, Hey, this could be a good way for you to go. So they lash out at the people who've made them feel bad. It's okay. It's part of the deal. Yeah. And I get it. Especially with kids where, you know, sometimes people, I'll, I'll hear people say like, you if you send your kid to public school, you're not a good parent. You should yeah. go into private school. And I'm just like, well, that, everyone's different yeah. and everyone has different beliefs. So you send your yeah. kid to private school right. and be awesome. And then you may yeah. inspire other people. <laughs> Where do we get and, so interested yeah. in telling other people that they're bad parents? I know. It's just unbelievable. It's I kinda, we, I all of us should know how hard a job it is because we do it. So the idea of like telling somebody else they're not doing it right is amazing to me. Yeah. It's like, why are we fighting in fighting within the village mm. instead of helping but totally and I, I think I was guilty of it too where I I would do things a certain way food wise and I think this is great I want to tell everyone to do this mm -hmm. and then I've slowly realized like that doesn't do anything right right yeah. where it's like I always say that that Buddha saying like when the student's ready the teacher right. appears exactly and it works both ways so it's kind of like I'm just going to do what I do and I love to show it. Right. And then if somebody's ready to hear it, then yep. I'll, I'll be glad. I love to be there. Right. And if they're not, then I'm not going to try to go catch them. Well, the kids are, are kids. There's nothing like having a kid to humble you. Like you may think you know the best way to eat and the best way to source things and all that kind of stuff, and then you put the food on the plate, and the kid's like, yeah, whatever. Or is too interested in dancing at that moment to eat. As our child is almost <laughs> always true. You know, like she when yeah. she eats, she eats. And she goes through growth spurts, and she will just eat four bowls of pasta with capers and fresh-made tomato sauce. And then there are other times it's just, you know, can you read me a story? I don't really, you know, she'll eat seemingly subsist on gluten-free crackers and air, you know. And that's, it's hard to realize that that's just biology. That's not your parenting skills or your cooking school skills. Yeah. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's some sort of, like, well, primal force. It's tough as a chef, because I'm sure Dan knows, oh, yeah. like, when, oh, you, when you cook, <laughs> you know, you do all this work. Oh, yeah. But then you get that that feeling of when people love your food. That's like the biggest high yeah, ever. Totally. First, first, you get the high of like just putting it out yeah. and having forty seven factors come together right. down to mm -hmm. a second. Right, that's like the best ever. Like yep. I'm sure you do. You put out a buffet and you have this like rush. Yeah, I just like I nailed it. Everything looks beautiful. It's the perfect. And then and then the kid doesn't eat it. Yeah, and then you look yeah. at the child, you're like, but I made this. I sweated for this. Why are you doing this? I'm going to go in the wrong corner and cry. Yeah, but even if you're, if you're 
customers don't like your food, yeah. you know, it, it bothers you. It's, right. it's not, you can't just go right. like, well, I guess they're just not into my stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. It's hard not to take it personally. And I, I would get that way with the kids too, where I'm just like, yeah, I made this food and I spent a lot of time right. and you don't like it. Or now, now I just let it go. I just go. Yeah. Like, right. I've gotten to that point too. And I don't know about you guys, but I've always preached a, if they don't like it, I don't just keep making new food until they, no, 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 until they find something oh, yeah. they like. No. I just kind of go, well, I'm going to eat this and you yeah. guys can hang out. Maybe <laughs> later we'll have some carrot sticks we or something. We told Lucy in if you, if, you're, if you don't want to eat dinner, that's fine. But you're going to go to bed hungry. And if you ask for food before bed, you're not going to get any. So, you know, and and I think that it's it's hard, but, it, you know, no kid's actually going to be long-term suffering yeah. from going to bed hungry one night and it's, it's happened once or twice and it's never happened again i mean we're well let's let's face it we're really lucky lucy eats everything she will eat you know she has very clear ideas this morning she said i really love peanut butter now i when i was a little kid i didn't used to love it but now i do and i think yeah. one of the we, things we decided early on with help of friends and other people was the most important thing is we want to just sit around the table and have it be a good place so if it's exactly. somewhere we want to remember fondly, then there can't be battles over dinner and there can't be eat three more bites, which I don't ever want to do because I want her to trust her own appetite. So if mm. she says she's done, she's done. Yeah, we don't want to make the dinner table a battleground. No. Nope. Because half the time with her, it's like, how was your day at school? I'll tell you at dinner. Yeah. And then if, <laughs> she's got a rule. If she doesn't do that, then she's not going to want to come to the dinner table. She decided that rule herself. And she I think it's partly because she knows when we're all three sitting at the dinner table, that's where we share our stories. So mm-hmm. when she's done with school, she's just had this amazing mental stimulation and also social stimulation of all these kids around her. We pick her up. We want to hear about her day. She needs a little decompression time. She wants to sit in the back of the car while we drive home and read some books and kind of like sing music with us, do that yeah. kind of stuff. So she'll say, oh, it's dinner. But if so, if we're in the middle of dinner and saying, eat your broccoli, then she's not going to share her stories. So we just we just trust her. We just don't – we try really hard every once in a while. And we're like, oh, she's not eating. And then we remind ourselves it's that time of the you know month where she's not eating that much because she's no more longer a growth spurt, you know, whatever it is. So we just back off yeah. and say, all right, fine, whatever you want to eat. Hey, we're going to enjoy our food. Because I think that's the main thing that we want to give her is we want her to see how much we love our food and how much we love all the food we eat and not just the treats and not just the special occasion dinner. And not just have a bunch of stigmas attached right. to it. So if we're jazzed about broccoli gratin or about sweet potatoes that night, then we want to eat them and enjoy them. I don't want to ruin my dinner by telling her, eat your food, eat your food. <laughs> so, She's not going to eat it. It's more for us. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah, and I always say that that for a lot of families, the, t- the table or food right. becomes the one place where all – where the kid realizes quick, right. I have some power here. Right, mm-hmm. right, totally. My my mom really wants me to eat, yep. so and I, I can don't use that. that I need. And it's just like, and then the bribery comes in. Oh gosh, no way! And it's like, it's terrible. You know, I'm just as soon as I see the parent, just like, you're not getting this unless you eat that. Mm-hmm. I'm just kind of like, oh, that food should never be so. I get the that. compulsion to do that for sure, and I've done it. Yeah, but it's like if that if it if you can get rid of that and yeah. just be like. Guess what? We don't eat dessert every night. No. And we definitely don't eat it as a reward no. for mm-hmm. dealing yeah, with dinner. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like a bonus on top of dinner. Totally. There's a great book um, written by a woman named Ellen Satter, S-A-T-T-E-R, and I think it's Feeding Your Child, and I can't remember if that's exact title, but something like it. And I read it before when I was pregnant with Lucy, and she's just so common sense. And what she said was... People get really hooked up on each individual meal. Like, you got to eat vegetables and meat, protein and fat, blah, blah, blah. you've got to eat now. And so the kid doesn't eat vegetables, you freak out. And what she said is just look at your kid's diet over the course of a week. If over the course of the week they're eating some vegetables and they've eaten some good food that you've made yourself and they have had a couple of treats, they're fine. You know, it, it's, it's a relaxation yeah. and a loosening and says, okay, let's mm. give this all some space. I mean, there are multiple studies that show even kids that are severely, mal- you know, like don't get good nutrition. Kids who with profound autism, for example, who don't eat anything but white bread, white without the crusts, you know, literally. Yeah. Their bodies compensate somehow, and nutritionally they're okay. They're not great, but they're okay. So if, like, even if that profound a situation, the kid's okay, if your kid doesn't eat broccoli one night, he's going to be fine. <laughs> Yeah, as opposed to turning him off broccoli for right. life because, because he, it becomes a battle. Because he looks at broccoli and stress, totally. stress response Not comes up. Interested? Mm. I mean, 
it's funny. We we both know that if if Lucy has does dance and does swimming, because um, there are things she loves. She never stops moving. So she does swim team and dance. And those days she needs a lot of food because she has just expended a lot of energy for a five year old. So we have learned if for some reason she's not interested in food that night, which is hey, let's talk about this. Let's play a game. I'm gonna read you a book, and then she just eats and eats and eats. She just needs that first little like relax, you know, like push to say. Oh, we're not even going to look at the food. Don't worry about that. You know, the other day, I we made some egg muffins with lots and lots of vegetables, which normally she loves. For some reason, she decided she didn't like them that morning. I'm okay, no problem. Hey, I'm done with mine. You want to, I'll read you Beauty and the Beast. So I'm reading her Beauty and the Beast, and she just sat there and ate three of the egg with vegetable yeah. muffins mm -hmm. because she forgot that she was supposed to be eating, you know? So any little tricks we'll use, yeah. definitely. Because I get that question a lot from parents who are like, okay, I have a picky kid. Yeah. How do I get him to eat? And I'm like, just nice. chill out. Yeah, really. Mm -hmm. I think it's relaxation. Just like let it let it go. Just eat and eat. Don't eat. Yep. You know, it's like I've, I only know known this term intermittent, intermittent fasting right. for the in the past like six months. Right, right, of course. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm just like, yeah, my, my daughter's intermittent fasting tonight. <laughs> <laughs> She's going for 18 hours without food. I'm sure she'll be hungry at the end of it. I think the main thing is that, you know, I want her to have a really strong sense of her own appetite and her own hunger and her own will. So I don't want to have, you know, I, we didn't have necessarily a clean plate club in my house, but there was definitely the notion we should be eating all our food. Um, yeah, this whole, like, you're not leaving this table until yeah, that place clean. Yeah, poor kids in China, blah, blah, blah. Pretty that's, soon, yeah. it's, it's 9 like o'clock at giving night. Giving a kid, kid like. a, uh, you know, an eating disorder right away. And so... I just, we are, you know, because food's so important to us and we get such joy out of it, we just want her to get joy out of it. That's probably more important to me than any nutritional makeup that she has. I mean, she loves vegetables and eats a lot of vegetables and eats good grass-fed meat and she has a really, really good diet, but we don't talk about, like, eat this vegetable. We're like, hey, you got to try this broccoli and this cheese sauce. It's fantastic. And so we, when we emphasize flavor and enjoyment, yeah. she ends up associating quote-unquote good food with with a good flavor Which yeah because really it's not like you can go to your kid and go you need this much vitamin mm -hmm. d in your diet mm -hmm. and since we live in northwest and it's mm -hmm. not sunny out mm -hmm. eat this sardine exactly. <laughs> and they're gonna be like yeah, are, what did you just say and that looks gross we do talk to her about like what protein does in your body and what carbohydrates do in your body and what vegetables do in your body and fats and how they feed the brain like we'll talk we've talked just this last year we've talked with her about that to the point that every once in a while now she'll be in the car and she'll say, Mom, I need some protein right now. <laughs> Which makes me That's tough. awesome. Mom, I'm getting hungry grumpy. I need yeah. some food. We I mean, call it hungry grumpy in our house. <laughs> so, I mean, we, we, I think, you know, if you go to Europe, if you go to Italy or France, there is that same sense that we're trying to replicate here of food as a whole is really important to us. And that means the enjoyment of it, but also means how it feeds you and how it can make you stronger and all those different things they're not mutually exclusive the way they can be in this culture so sustenance and joy go together yeah and I've always said that though I think when I think your boots are on the front porch buddy and in, the right the in general of Americans we tend to think like we we almost can't enjoy it right. like put a piece of cheesecake in front of someone and, the, and all their thought is like, oh, I really want this, but it's going to go straight to my hips mm -hmm. and this and this and this and that. And then in my mind, what I believe is, yeah, it is. Yeah. If that's what you're thinking when you eat exactly. it. Uh -huh. totally. But if you're like with your friends and you know, you picture like three, three, fr three old ladies in France who have been friends forever that cheesecake's not even going to affect them because right. mm -hmm. they're just like, this is right. awesome. Well, we enjoyed our cheesecake. And it might be half the, or well, it might be one-tenth the portion of like Cheesecake Factory. Yeah, because if you're but enjoying like, it, you actually slow down and savor it. You realize when you're full, so you don't, I mean, it took me my whole yeah. life to realize that really until this year. But if you slow down and put your fork between bites and truly savor it, you won't need nearly as much of that cheesecake as you thought you would. Because or, it's not associated with all the emotional stuff, too. Or, like, when you're eating, you don't eat with... Like, when people are on vacation, you don't... You're just, you're just like, oh, there's no stress involved. You're just eating. Instead of yeah. eating at home, like, oh, I need to do this, sir. Uh, it's just like, Ugh. Yeah, or you're like, that ice cream's in the freezer. I don't want it. 
it's there. It's yeah, it's like when we were on vacation, where we go in last year. Providence. Yeah, Providence. Oh man, that's good food. He, yeah, and he lost a lot of weight too. Yeah, and I came home and I asked my uh, friend who's a nutritionist, why do I always lose weight when I'm on vacation? Because I'm not skinny and I never will be, you know? And so I was like, wow, I'm on vacation. Is it because I'm walking so much? Like, why do I lose seven pounds in a week when I'm eating charcuterie, you know? And she said, oh, I know exactly what it is. It's because when we eat with any sense of guilt or should or obligation, it actually triggers our fight or flight response. And that releases yes. cortisol in your body, which makes you, you know, stressfully hold on to every pound. But when you eat joyfully and you eat like complete abandon, savoring it, no emotional attachment to it, it actually triggers your metabolism into higher gear. Yes. So I wish everyone in America knew this. All you have to do if you want to lose weight is actually savor your food and be happy when you eat it. <laughs> yeah. And that and that goes with just stress in general. Exactly. Really, that cortisol thing, where it's right. just like people are have the perfect diet, right? Tons of exercise, and they're just like, I can't get this right. last bit, and right. it's like the stress you can just, just get relax. you through that bit. Exactly. And you know, stress is a whole other thing where totally, you know, there's that debate of what I always get into is like, there's look at things a different way if you don't want to be stressed. Or there's the people who are like, that's just the way I am. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like a badge yeah. of pride. <laughs> it's weird. Yeah, because I used to do that with people too, where I'd, they'd be like freaking out in the car, and I'm like, chill out, just look at it this way, this, that. And they're just like, that's the way I am. And then mm-hmm. I realized, like, okay, here's another thing I can't tell yeah, people. Yeah, nope, I, I just need to be my calm center here in the passenger seat, mm-hmm. and maybe that'll go off to them or oh, not. totally. Or you but, get out of the car soon. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, I'm like, now I'm getting stressed because they're stressed. Like, uh-huh. I don't want them to be stressed, so I'm being stressed, and I'm just like, this doesn't make sense. And stress to me is like the biggest thing, like it is cause killer. of sickness, it's death. Killer. It's like the one thing I feel – we can control right. a lot more than most things. Yeah, and stress yeah. is also a really big liar. There's that too. Like you get stressed out about something, and I still, yeah. you know, I had a lot of insomnia this last year until I figured out some of my health stuff too. And the worst time of the day is four in the morning. Like it, 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 for everything is awful. It doesn't matter if you've just woken up. You're like, oh, I'm gonna start worrying about money or whatever, you know. But it's a liar because you wake up later in the day and you're like, why was I worried about that? It's okay. But I feel like stress is yeah. four in the morning perpetually. You're constantly telling yourself, like, oh, my God, I'm going to die if this thing happens. And either it doesn't happen or it does happen and you didn't die. And yet we don't seem to be able to look back at all those times where we're stressed or freaked out or afraid, whatever you want to say. And then the thing we're afraid of didn't kill us and take it and put it into our lives. Like, well, maybe that's true on this time. (laughs) So, I mean, I think stress, there is plenty of information to show that stress is physically harmful it's clearly emotionally harmful i mean anytime you're living all tensed up in your life it can't be good yeah or just figuring out ways to use use the stress because you can't unless you're like a hippie on a commune (laughs) you can't just be like oh i'm late for work who cares yeah exactly you you have to go through your scale you know like to me the only the time i feel the most stress is trying to get my kids right. when there's a time schedule oh yeah, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, yeah. like we we just had that exchange <clears throat> yesterday it's like yeah. i'll meet you i'll come out here today and we'll meet right. but if like i don't even look at the ferry schedule no because i know that'll make my morning stressful yeah we gotta get in this thing because yeah, we gotta no, get no, here no. and what if there's a line and this and now i'm stressed and yeah. nothing, none of this has even happened yet yeah yeah but i'm already setting, you know, it up, I'm setting myself up to it. fail and you've imagined a terrible day and it hasn't where it's there. like i'll be here at this approximate time when we we'll, when we leave, we leave. When we get to the ferry terminal, yep. we'll take the next ferry we get yep. on yep. and see what happens. And it's like it makes the you know, there's because it's not like if there's school, you know, school starts at nine right. fifteen, we gotta get there at nine fifteen. I'm not gonna be late. So there's that's when I get a little stressed yeah. or just like that. But so I I just set myself up to win where I'm like, yeah. Oh, I'll wake up a half hour earlier uh-huh. so I have my time. Right to chill out a bit and I don't have to make the lunch really right. fast. I can right. make it slow. Yeah. And if that means a little less sleep for me, that's fine. Cause I'm, right. you know, I'm, I've been doing this program of just like improving myself mm-hmm. and I kind of 
I took a lot of things on at once, and now I'm just adding things one by one. Mm-hmm, where it's like, mm-hmm. got it, yeah. it, start, it started with diet, exercise, and quitting alcohol all right. at the same time, right. meaning fairly extreme diet. And I sort of took some of the enjoyment out of it, mm-hmm. but only because I didn't need that. Mm-hmm. Like I was, I feed people for a living. Mm-hmm. My kids are constantly hungry. I'm always dealing with food. Yeah. So for myself, if all I'm thinking about is like, what's the best thing I could eat right now, right. health wise, then it's it's not another equation of like, oh, I gotta feed myself too. Right. And well, so, well, it's also another way of, of like having that fight or flight response. I think if people, I watch people do this all the time, and I was prone to it earlier this year too. Which is like, what is the perfect diet? There's so many books and you know things called the perfect diet health you know just mix those words around that's what they're called but there's no joy in the food if you're doing that and so it may be the perfect diet chris kressler who we saw today likes to quote (laughs) likes to quote as an ancient uh, chinese proverb which is you can eat it's better to eat bad food in the right mood than eat good food in in the in the wrong mood Mm-hmm. And it's absolutely mm-hmm. true. Your body doesn't know you're eating, you know, insert name of diet here. It just knows what you're eating, but it also ha- it knows how you're eating it. So if you're eating it joyfully and, you know, come into my body, I'm so excited for this, there, it's going to be very different. You found lots of money. Wow. Find all this money. <laughs> yeah. And so I, that's, that's the same experience we've been trying to give Lucy, which is just let's enjoy this and let's not think here's the right way to eat. Let's just have some food together. Yeah. Speaking of, we should probably end soon. <laughs> yeah. But, but, but what I'm saying is I I got to this point where the eating the really nutrition, like the, the way I thought was the right. healthy, the way I wanted to eat, that I was getting enjoyment out of that. Yeah. And to where I might have got enjoyment out of a donut before, mm-hmm. I took two bites of a donut and I was like, this is You're terrible. Right. Yeah, like, I feel stuff. terrible. I'm not yeah. going to eat this. Oh, yeah. And so it got rid of all my like cravings oh, that's cool. mm-hmm. by the way I was choosing to eat. And that right. was sort of the, the process, which was, it's almost opposite of the way people tell mm-hmm. you to lose. Cause it's like, I, I, I love fat. Like I think yeah. a high fat diet is awesome if you're eating, not drinking canola oil. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you, if you do the research of really good fats yeah. and stuff. So just before we end, let's touch on real quick about how it, Two things, I guess. If you see people that you know or you love, and they're they're obviously not eating in a in a healthy way. Say they have kids. Uh huh. I just saw a guy at the ferry terminal, very overweight, reading the newspaper, which means he's probably stressed out because there's no way he can read the newspaper without getting stressed out. Mm. Smoking a cigarette and sitting there in the front, and I'm just like, how do I? Mm. What do I say to that guy mm. to get him? Which I I know is. There's nothing. Yeah. But if mm-hmm. there's if there's someone who maybe said like, where do I start? You know, they made that first move like, I'm a mess and I have these kids and I want to live and, and take care of these kids. Like, where do you start as far as like? Well, a lot what's of your it, first move. A lot of it is they they need to realize that, accept the fact that they need help or they need to get off whatever they're doing. Because you can go preach to somebody, you Awareness. need to stop this. Or, yeah, you need to stop this, and they're not going to listen. It's you need to stop eating like yeah. this. It's like, no, I don't. They're going to be mad at you for doing it. Too. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think the main thing we would we would probably do that situation is feed people. <laughs> Say, hey, you want to come over for lunch? We we yeah. you know, hey, would love to have you and come on over. This is what we you know. Oh, did you want to know? Well, this is what we feed our daughter. I mean, I just think that I don't think anyone. I, I taught high school for years. So I know the worst thing you can do is to tell kids what to do. You're like, okay, you're going to do this, and this is why The Great Gatsby is important, and you are going to enjoy this book. <laughs> it's never going to work. Well, like, that could be go with adults, too. Well, you absolutely. need to eat like this, and yeah. that's what we, we don't preach. But if you engage yeah. someone where he or she is, so talking to 16-year-olds is different than 85-year-olds, but if you try to really just drop everything and listen and talk, then and, and emphasize what you're really loving about what you're doing, and people respond to enthusiasm. People respond to joy. And people yes. really respond to, like, the openness that comes with joy. And so I just think that's always going to be more powerful than any, like, 
pamphlet you can hand them or lesson you can try to teach them. You can just, I think that our job is just to try to kind of like be open to whatever light there is in the world and see if we can reflect it back. Yeah, I agree. And I think if, if everyone could do that with everything mm. in life, of just like, you know, I've, when I, in that one blog post I put like, if you want to inspire people to be vegan, yeah. just be a badass vegan. Yeah, totally. Who, yeah. who like lives this awesome life yeah. and you're doing all yeah, this stuff totally. and you're climbing mountains. And look and radiantly healthy like, and everyone says, <laughs> yeah. what are you doing? I want to do that. What, yeah. do you, what do you got going? Totally. You're like, well, for me, this is what works. Yeah. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, and it's just like we're fighting through even uh, like the best way to be healthy. Yeah. And, you know, you know, first of all, everyone's got a different story and everyone has is in a different place in their lives. So that's why I'm not interested in telling people how they should eat because I don't know. I mean, I learned a new way of eating this year that I didn't know a year ago. So if you told, if I, a year ago, I was like, here's what you should be doing. I would now be talking to the self. I would now, now I'd be talking to the self I was a year ago. So yeah. I just think it's important that we enjoy it along the way and we just keep open. Yeah. And know a year from now, what, what you think is right now, might, right. you might not think is right. Right. It's mm -hmm. constantly evolving. Totally. And, Evolving and like parenting, same way. Like oh, there's gosh, no. Yeah. Well, they're our best teachers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's... You can't really plan on what you're going to do or what, what you're going to teach the kid. And well, most you of the teachers' patience. With it. Yeah, and you just got to go with it. And and there's, I mean, the best part of parenting is all the joy, you know. So it's like yeah. it's just sad that we clamp down and think our job as parents is to, with a lot of rules and you know what we're supposed to do and how you're supposed to eat. It's really just the joy, and that's that's the why we do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and just to be to be a kid yourself again. That's totally. my favorite part. Is like, totally. oh yeah, I, I can go to the park and like, oh, I get to go on the merry-go-round. I know, it's awesome. <laughs> it's like, yeah, if you don't have your kid with you, it's a little creepy. Yeah, it's a little yeah. <laughs> so like, rent a child, yeah. <laughs> but, but I always be just like, I see a lot of parents just sitting there with their phone oh, yeah. while their kids are playing, and yeah. I'm just like, man, you're missing out. This is exactly. there's so much fun to be so had right fun. here. Uh -huh. So much fun. So so. Cool. I appreciate it. Um, I'll let everyone know after this where to where to find you guys and check it out. And, Vice uh, versa. Do the uh, blog you're you're following on your Twitter and blog is pretty amazing to me because sometimes I'm just like <laughs> I'm like oh it's just Shauna I know yeah. them, I know them and then I'm like <laughs> but this guy you know look at Tim Ferriss and I'm like you got you have more twi Twitter followers than like some of these huge internet guys where I'm just like <laughs> it's such a crazy world out there of how we can it's a crazy world we can reach everybody i was talking to that of how i can set up in your living room table with a few yeah. microphones and a laptop uh -huh. totally cool. and amazing. have the potential to reach it's amazing millions of people and then we're all reaching like different people you know like not it's certainly true that what we do does not work for everybody and the same for you and but we do all just find our people and the internet is a great place and a great way to find your people it's not yeah. always a great place but it's a great way to find your people um, yeah. And that's what I think it is. It's just like, it's really just, we, we, it's like sitting around the campfire. We just have a much bigger campfire now. Yeah. yeah. And, I'm, and I'm working on lately. I was, I felt my approach, I was kind of afraid mm -hmm. and I wanted to please everybody. Mm -hmm. and that's always my thing is mm -hmm. please everybody. And I learned from parenting mm -hmm. that you're going to be a terrible parent. <laughs> terrible. <Yeah. laughs> well, no, you could. You could say my job is to please oh, my I kid, know. A lot and of that, do. that kid's going to be a horrible. And that's human something being. we all have to work with every day because it's it's uh, it's part of the job. Yeah, but I found recently that is if I'm passionate enough about something and into it and care about it, then it doesn't affect me at all if people don't like it yeah. or if they're indifferent about it yeah. or if they're totally think I'm an idiot. Mm -hmm. If, if I'm not adamant about it, then it's like, Oh, that's fine. That's your, yep. that's your deal. That's your I'm, I'm yeah. still going with this. I'm not going to change. No, oh, I love that. Um, was that expression? What other people think of me is none of my damn business. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, yeah I think that was you, Eleanor Roosevelt. Yeah. It's like everyone. You put, you put work in the world, that's a way of letting go of it. So as soon as you let go of it, you can't have any control over how anybody's going to react to it. And writing for me is an act of letting go, and cooking probably is for you too. Like mm -hmm. you, oh, yeah. You cook something, it's, and then you... Very, for me, it's very meditative. Mm -hmm. 
And that's a, yeah. and that's, and that's so to come from that meditative state, because writing is for me too, and then say, yes, but how, what does everyone think of it? It just completely doesn't make sense. You know? Yeah. And it goes both ways too. Totally. Or if you, you put something on Facebook and then the rest of your night is seeing how many people liked it. Oh, you got it. And if nobody liked it, you're depressed oh, yeah. and you're <laughs> happy so if a hundred people liked it. And it's just like to put something out there, yeah. not thinking of like mm-hmm. or not like. Yeah. And then, yeah, yeah, like you said, let it go and just be oh, like, yeah. no, because that's why I'm always like, okay, now what's next? Oh, yeah. yeah. I made this video, put yeah. it out. Okay, now what's next? next? It's the work that really What's next? And then and it's, it's fun to check and see, like, if it's resonating <laughs> with people. Totally. And stuff, but it's like not having that, not being attached right. to that yeah, outcome right. is the difference. I mean, we, we've definitely done that with the books we've done, because the first book, like, where's, where's that on the, on the on Amazon? Where's it on Amazon? Now we're just like... I haven't checked it's gone. In, I haven't yeah. checked in months. And everyone says it now. It's like if you if your goal is to write a right. New York Times bestseller, your book's gonna suck. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean you're not producing anything authentic. And if it right. does end up being a New York Times bestseller, that's fantastic. But that can't be your goal. Yeah. Because then you really should just go do something yeah. else. Yeah, it's like you either write or we cook to if you cook or write to impress, it's not gonna happen. Mm-hmm. If you cook to connect, that's when it's gonna happen. Yep. Yeah, I don't yep. know. I I cook trying to impress every night. <laughs> no, actually, I, I cook trying to not upset. Right. Yeah. Right. That's Same totally thing. Right <laughs> but to me, there's I have much different types of cooking. I cook yeah. this way, this way, this. So it's like I'm I'm lucky. I feel lucky to I get to cook as my job and yeah, as right. my life and as my kids. And yeah. every once in a while, I'm kind of like, can I have five seconds without cooking something? Yeah. Please? Yeah. Exactly. That's also <laughs> so, pretty nice. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, cool. Thanks a lot. We kind of got a Lord of the Fly situation <laughs> happening, yeah. quick, escalating quickly. We should probably be going So we don't miss. Well, thanks so much. <laughs> Thank thanks you. for coming on. And then uh, we'll go from there. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Greg. That was awesome. All right. Hope you enjoyed this episode of the Chef and Father podcast with Gluten-Free Girl and the Chef. Once again, check out their blog at glutenfreegirl.com. Really cool stuff. They're on Twitter. They're on Facebook. All the usual stuff. Um, If you want to check us out, we go to chefandfather.com or chefandfather on Facebook and Twitter. And if you can do me a huge favor and just go to the iTunes page and comment, rate us, let me know what you think. Let me know who you want to see, who you want us to get on the show, and what we can do for you. Uh, It's just about talking about food, talking about kids, trying to make this world a better place. So, Chef and Father podcast, and have a good day.